When I was young, my brother and I built a boat with our father. We spent several years sailing and exploring the Patuxent River. And then I met Tony. Peter and I spent many happy times on that boat. And so when we got married, we built a larger boat and ventured out into the Chesapeake Bay and its many rivers. We crewed on larger boats with dreams of sailing the world, but then life took another turn. Today, we look forward to retirement with dreams of leaving it all behind. Come join us on our journey to sail the seas. Welcome. As you can see, summer is long gone. Just barely a few leaves desperately clinging to the branches. I'm back here hiking through the woods and it dawned on me that uh, uh, an idea for an episode came out. I'm gonna call this episode Peter's Pet Peeves. And what I mean about this is the stuff that I've seen on boats that always makes you kind of scratch your head like, what were they thinking? The marine architects and engineers are pretty smart folks. But then you go on some of these boats and you, and you just scratch your head going, what the hell, you know, what was going on? So I'll share some of these observations and uh, make an episode out of it. But before we get too far in there, there's, there's a couple clarifications we need to make. You have the catamarans that are designed specifically for people who want to sail, explore the world, easily handled, uh, perform, performance oriented. Then you have the catamarans that are designed specifically for the charter industry. And I, and I call these uh, charter marans. And they're designed for something totally different than, than sailing the world. Uh, they're designed for luxury. Um, the purpose of a charter moran is to go from point A to point B during the day. They're, you know, most char charters don't allow you to sail at night. Drop an anchor going from place to place. People come on. They spend just a week on, on the boat. They want the lap of luxury. They want high decks. They want fancy drinks and, and uh, all that. But from a sailor's point of view, these are not the boats that you typically want to get to sail sail the world if your intent is to island hop in the caribbean um yeah there's nothing wrong with these boats but you see a lot of the charter brands used and abused coming on the market for sale and pe people buy them so i'll point some of these uh observations out so people can be aware of it uh so i hope you enjoyed this episode these are peter's pet peeves tony won't have anything to do with this episode but eh. Okay, we'll see how it goes. I'm not going to call the brand of the boat out. I don't need hate mail, uh, but most people can probably figure it out. But it's not about the brand of the boat. It's just these nuances that have you head, scratching your head. Let's start with number one. For those that know me, they know I don't like a raised helm. Now, this was a nice boat. I had a lot of fun on this boat, but let's freeze it right here. Look at the steps going up to this helm. The treads aren't even even. As you try to go up and down these stairs, you have to hit the stairs just right. Now imagine yourself in rough seas and you're in a hurry to either get up or get down to, to lend a hand. You're gonna break a leg. I don't know what, what they were thinking when they designed steps like this on a boat. I mean, these are leg breakers in a house. You shouldn't have spiral staircase going up to the helm. Like, what the hell? People would tell you that an elevated helm gives you better visibility. I don't really think that's true. If the elevated helm is on the port side, you have a great view of the port side, a restricted view of the starboard, and vice versa. If you have an elevated helm on the starboard side, you kind of sacrifice visibility on the port side. With the foresail is up, it can restrict your visibility, especially when you're up on an elevated helm. If you're sailing in crowded waters, you find yourself going down the stairs, running over to the opposite side, and looking to make sure the coast is clear, then to come running back up to the helm. It's quite an exercise. The more you're running up and down the stairs, the more likelihood you're going to slip and crack a leg or break a leg, especially on a moving boat at sea. Another downside of an elevated helm is if you're the one on watch, you're kind of left isolated all by yourself while everyone down in the saloon or cockpit is, ha is having a great conversation. Sometimes you just want to be part of the conversation. Of course, 
the more elevated the helm is, the more pronounced the C motion is. So if you're prone to seasickness, you don't want an elevated helm. The last thing I like to point out is the higher the elevated helm station, the higher the boom, and the higher the center of effort on, on your sails. And this is something you really just don't want on a sailing catamaran. The helm should be straightforward and well laid out. Let's freeze this frame here. Do you see what I see? This is just simply insane. Take a look at these two Yanmar diesel engine control panels. You have to reach your hand through the wheel to power on, start, or stop the port engine. This is insane. You never really want to put your hand through a wheel anyway. If you were operating this boat under power, you would have to crouch just to see what RPMs you're pulling or to see if there's any check engine indicator lights or warning lights are on. If you weren't crouching and looking, you might not never know. To add insanity to insanity, notice the plexiglass covers over the controls. This makes it very difficult and awkward to slide your hand up in there to power on and start the motors in any case of emergency. I guess the plexiguard covers are there to protect anybody from inadvertently hitting the controls with their knees. The helm layout should be straightforward and intuitive. You should be able to see and touch all the controls without sticking your hands through the wheel. A clear example of what in the hell they were thinking. The winches should be well laid out and easily accessible from the helm position. On this boat, these are electric winches, which are great. They're great right up to the point where they stop working because you don't have any electricity. It was very difficult to get up there and crank these winches by hand if you had to climb up there. Tony couldn't even reach these winches regardless. This boat had a little step that you can step up to reach the winches. I had difficulty cranking these winches by hand. Tony couldn't even reach them so they weren't much use to her. All helm seats should be two butt compatible. A couple should be able to sit at the helm comfortably. You'd be surprised how many helm seats are only one big butt compatible, but two butts cannot fit in there comfortably. This drives me nuts. The original owner of this boat chose not to select the helm seat option for whatever reason. It kind of blows my mind. Any helm seat should have a backrest to be quite comfortable to sit in. This relieves stress and helps with fatigue. Visibility from the helm seat should be good. You should be able to keep watch while sitting at the helm seat. This boat ticked all the boxes, but if you wanted to sit down while sailing, you would have had to enable the auto helm and then sit on the back seat. The galley is a very important part of the boat. This is where your meals are prepared. When you're on passage, you really want a nice hot meal. Now there's really nothing wrong with this galley on this, this charter marine here, but some points you need to take a, a note of is we'll, we'll stop it right here. This galley, uh, while perfectly adequate, uh, it's only adequate at anchor. If it's calm and the water's calm and you're anchored on a mooring ball, there's nothing wrong with this galley. But there's no bracing in this galley if you were cooking underway. Even in the slightest of swells or seas, you can get knocked around here because you can't brace your body in here. Um, and this could lead to injury, especially if you're cooking something hot and it spills on you. So keep, in that, keep that in mind. This is a 40-foot boat. This is what you kind of get when you cram a galley up in a 40-foot boat. And here's another example of me demonstrating if I was under passage and the waves were hitting me. You really want to brace yourself in the galley. Here's another example of suicide stairs going up to a flybridge that's almost three stories high. I would say two and a half stories. This is only a 46 foot boat. If you get up here, you see some of these big screens. Notice that you can't even see the stern. You can't see the transoms on this boat, despite being up on the flybridge. You have like reverse cameras on this particular boat to see the back. Here we have another example of an elevated helm and even a higher elevated uh, lounge area. Look how high you are up off the water. Look how high the boom is. Talking about a nosebleed section. I mean, it was a nice boat, but it's not something you want to do in the, in the swells of the ocean.
I don't know what is up with these reversed open hatches. They're not going to keep water out on their way and they're going to make it hard to scoop up the breeze at anchor. Let's freeze the frame here. If you look closely, you'll see the clear plastic cockpit protection. A lot of these boats are very expensive, yet they have a simple canvas binomy over the top, and you can drop down these plastic clears. In, in a squall or any type of weather, this is not gonna really hold up too well. Uh, the canvas is eventually going to rot, and it's just another thing that's going to have to replace over time. There's nothing more important on a boat than protection, not only from foul weather, but from the sunshine as well. And it should be really a hard top, a fiberglass, carbon fiber, some permanent structure that you don't have to worry about replacing. A lot of them will have a window to look up so you can see your sails, but I can't stress the point strong enough that you need protection from the sun. I understand having these lounges areas up there for pretty girls to sun themselves, but look at that boom. That's dangerous. I wouldn't want somebody up there while I was sailing, possibly getting smacked in the head with that boom. And here's another example of a canvas sun protection. This is just gonna rot. Another concern I see on some boats is the salon. If you take a look at this particular boat, and we froze the frame here, look how square the front of that salon is. If a wave ever came back and, and hit the salon, and you do take waves over the bow, uh, it, it's gonna take and absorb the full brunt of that wave. And that energy could possibly uh, stove in that, those, that entire front window. And make it even worse, there's a little lip over top of it, which is nice for rain, keeping the windows open in the rain, but that's going to collect even more of that energy. So I, I would be afraid that this front would stove in. Compare the angle to this boat. This boat is prepared to take some waves over the bow. Most of the energy of the wave is going to be deflected up and over. It doesn't take much of an angle to deflect the energy of the wave. Something to keep in mind if you're planning on sailing the oceans. Now here's a boat with the helm stations all the way in the stern. But before I talk about that, let's stop and take a look at this protection. Once again, this is canvas protection. It's almost simply an umbrella over your head. And I guess if you're only sailing at noon when the sun's directly overhead, you might be in the shade. I, I, I don't know what they were thinking. This is not much cover. Uh, for for the helmsman even in the sunshine and weather's just going to slam the hell out of you Moving on the motion of the sea is going to be exaggerated when you're all the way in the stern of the boat Just as if you were in the bow of the boat So if you're prone to motion sickness or seasickness, you're going to be tossed around a little bit in the stern I, I don't like this The sterns in this position does give you a good view of that side of the boat However, if you were sailing in crowded waters or navigating crowded waters, you kind of lose the view of the opposite side. So in this case, if you're on the port side, you would have to walk over to the starboard side to make sure everything's clear. The good news is this boat doesn't have stairs, so you just walk over to the other helm station on the starboard side. Being this far aft really feeds into my phobia of being washed overboard. Here's another example of a boat with the helm stations all the way aft, all the way in the stern. I don't particularly like this setup because the sugar scoops back there, that's how you get your gear and stuff off and on with the dinghy. And that aft helm seat looks like it's just gonna get in the way. Maybe it folds or moves or whatever. Again, there is no protection from the elements or the sun. And if you lean back too far, you're going to plop and splash into the ocean. I, I don't like this setup. And what's up with the shape of that wheel? I want you to focus on the wheel on this boat, and we'll stop it right here. This wheel spans the entire width of the aft cockpit. To move from the aft cockpit to the forward cockpit, you have to squeeze in between the wheel, step over the track that holds the main sheets. This is dangerous as hell. This boat is fast, but if you get hit a wave, the first thing you're gonna grab for support is the wheel. This was a huge turnoff for me and Tony. Maybe they could have worked in a tiller or something better than that wheel. 
You spend a lot of time in the cockpit, and most catamarans will have a cockpit table. What I don't like about some of them is they're more like a booth. I don't like eating in a booth in a restaurant because you constantly have to get in and get out to let somebody slide in. And on a boat, this becomes a little bit more difficult because the boat's moving. If it was only me and Tony, this would be fine because we wouldn't have to get out of somebody's way to slide in. Or if you're sailing with a lot of young people, they can just simply climb over and get to the seat without disturbing you. I don't know if this is a peeve, a compromise, or a nitpick, but I'm mentioning it out loud. Now this is my biggest pet peeve. I just don't understand why people still do this in this day and age. Why are they still designing multi-hulls with one hull? Blows my mind. Ugh. Yes, those were my pet peeves on some of these boats. Sometimes I have to ask myself, what were they thinking? Death traps. Um, I look out at this type of stuff in my older age, my younger age. Maybe the stairs going up to the helm wouldn't have been a big problem. Maybe climbing over the seats in the cushion wouldn't have been a m much of a problem. Uh, moving around in a cockpit wouldn't have been much of a, of a problem. But when you get older, you have to start thinking of these things. That boat is a constant perpetual state of motion. And uh, you have to ask yourself, what were the designers thinking when they put a boat, designed a boat that was made to sail the seven seas, uh, and, and they put some of these inherent uh, dangers in. I pointed out a lot of stuff that I did not like about these boats. There are stuff that I did like about these boats that I did not cover, because that's not what this episode was about. So. Don't be complaining that uh, you know that these are good boats or bad boats. I'm not saying any of these boats are bad. I'm just saying I did not like these particular aspects of the boat. Um, anyway, if you like what we're doing, uh, click the thumbs up. If you want to get notified when we post a new video, click the notification bell. By all means, subscribe. And I will see you the next episode. Thanks for watching. If you like this episode, by all means. What the hell? <laughs>